When Halsey invoked urgency and immediacy, he did it not in complaint but in affirmation, on behalf of specific tasks and challenges. The long memorandum he sent to Nimitz, demanding more of everything above all, tankers and more tankers and more tankers, was detailed and straightforward, but did not suggest or else disaster will follow, as Gormley's sometimes did. You are well aware of our needs, and this is not offered in complaint or as an excuse, but just to keep the pot boiling, he wrote to Nimitz. His manner of securing a new headquarters from the French administration at Noumea reflected his action-minded personal ethos. One day he sent his intelligence officer, Marine Colonel Julian P. Brown, to discuss his headquarters accommodations with the free French governor. Wearing his best dress uniform, pinned with decorations dating to the First World War, Brown presented himself and began pressing the case for a new American facility ashore. When the governor asked, what do we get in exchange? Brown replied with the same ordnance on target forthrightness that Halsey was known for, if with some uncharacteristic sobriety. We will continue to protect you as we have always done. This somehow failed to impress the governor, who in grand diplomatic fashion took the matter under advisement. It required little more of such treatment before Halsey went volcanic. He rode ashore with a contingent of marines, marched to the headquarters of Admiral Thierry d'Argentlieu, the surly haute commissaire, posted the US colours, and, finding the Frenchman absent, took over his office and set out his guard. For his personal quarters, Halsey seized the former Japanese consul's residence, a brick house with a view of the harbour. As construction battalions broke ground for new recreational facilities, until then strictly forbidden by the Free French, it was clear whose well-being Halsey was committed to, and whose loyalty he was out to win. As Halsey was taking South Pacific Area Command's reins in Noumea, US naval intelligence concluded that Admiral Yamamoto had assumed direct command of Japanese naval forces in the area. On October 19, radio snoopers noted something else that seemed ominous. High precedence traffic had dropped to a level suggesting that the combined fleet was in the final period of adjustment and preparation for action on a major scale. The nightly runs of the Tokyo Express through the slot had boosted the Japanese garrison on Guadalcanal from 6 to 22,000 men, nearly a match for the 23,000 Americans there. Several hundred miles north of Guadalcanal, the main elements of the Japanese carrier and battleship fleet were marking time, preparing for a new assault on the island, coordinated with an attack by Japanese troops ashore. Under pressure from the Joint Chiefs to lend more support to the Guadalcanal operation, Douglas MacArthur foresaw a dark future if the Navy did not meet Yamamoto's challenge. If we are defeated in the Solomons, as we must be unless the Navy accepts successfully the challenge of the enemy surface fleet, the entire Southwest Pacific will be in gravest danger. MacArthur continued, I urge that the entire resources of the United States be diverted temporarily to meet the critical situation. The fleet would be left to exert itself piecemeal. On October 20, the San Francisco and Helena, joined by the heavy cruiser Chester and six destroyers, entered Savo Sound to throw shells into the jungle near Cape Esperance. The mission came at a prohibitive price when a Japanese submarine put a torpedo into the Chester, forcing her removal for repair. As Imperial ground forces on Guadalcanal marshalled for a new assault near the Matanikau Delta, Halsey decided to move his carrier task force into waters east of the embattled island. The Enterprise and the Hornet, escorted by the South Dakota, steamed northwest of Santa Cruz, casting search planes around the compass. At midday on October 25, a PBY Catalina spotted the vanguard of a large Japanese battle group. The return of two patched-up capital ships, the Enterprise and the South Dakota, and the arrival of a fiery new theater commander, put American forces in a position to be aggressive again. The rumblings of these events reached all the way to Pearl Harbor. Today, our Saturday, 24 October, Halsey's Sunday, 25th October, will be a memorable day, Nimitz wrote Catherine. It is the start of the big, long-expected push, and we are as nearly ready as it is humanly possible to be. Tonight and tomorrow will be critical in our history, and pray God they will be successful for us. When Gormley arrived at Pearl Harbor with Spruance, they were, as Nimitz wrote, 
Tired, hungry, and much in need of baths, which they had missed for several days while in our island staging points, they soon got a bath, in the bright light of publicity. They arrived at Nimitz's headquarters almost simultaneously with the morning paper announcing the change of command. The view expressed in informed quarters here, read Charles Hurd's page one story in the New York Times, was to the effect that the new Solomon's commander would be expected to turn that venture from a currently defensive operation into an aggressive fight. Very little informed analysis of the basic meaning of these changes was possible here, in view of the complete silence on the part of the men best qualified to explain them. Sitting down with Nimitz, Gormley asked, What did I do that was wrong? Nimitz produced a sheaf of the dispatches Gormley had sent him. Nimitz said that if things were as dire as the dispatches indicated, we needed the very best man we had to hold down that critical area, and then I asked him whether he was that very best man. Gormley told Nimitz he could make no such claim. Gormley was a talented and decent man, but the war had outgrown his gifts. Writing Nimitz, Secretary Frank Knox was critical of the outgoing commander, referring to his complete lack of offensive use of our surface craft until Norman Scott's very successful raid north of Savo Island. Knox thought the early days of the Pacific campaign resembled the start of the Civil War. I presume most of us, if we had been required to choose at the beginning of the war between the brilliant, socially attractive McClellan and the rough, rather uncouth, unsocial Grant, would have chosen McClellan, just like Lincoln did. As Gormley's staffer Charles W. Weaver would write, when history is written, the good admiral will have his place in it, if the account faithfully records the true facts of the admiral's great burden in the early days of the Pacific War. As Gormley returned to Pearl Harbor to take the post of Commandant of the 14th Naval District in Hawaii, President Roosevelt was watching events in the South Pacific with something more than a Commander-in-Chief's typical remove. After standing forcefully for the idea that aid to Russia was essential to defeating the Axis and supporting a Europe-first strategy, his interest in the Solomons campaign was vigorous. His oldest son, James, was serving on Guadalcanal. Despite the potentially disqualifying handicap of being handed, at age 28, a reserve commission as a lieutenant colonel, which in time he rejected, Major James Roosevelt set himself to emulating the example of his father's rough-riding fifth cousin. A capable and popular officer, he urged the creation of a new type of commando unit, Marine Raiders, which under the leadership of Evans Carlson and Merritt Edson would go on to distinguish themselves at Guadalcanal and elsewhere. James served as the executive officer of the 2nd Marine Raiders on Guadalcanal, despite chronic physical ailments. On October 24, FDR wrote to the Joint Chiefs of Staff, My anxiety about the Southwest Pacific is to make sure that every possible weapon gets into that area to hold Guadalcanal, and that, having held in this crisis, that munitions and planes and crews are on the way to take advantage of our success. We will soon find ourselves engaged in two active fronts and we must have adequate air support in both places, even though it means delay in our commitments, particularly to England. Our long-range plans could be set back for months if we fail to throw our full strength in our immediate and impending conflicts. Roosevelt's urgent sense of events in the South Pacific developed not a moment too soon for King, Nimitz and Halsey. On the very day he urged his joint chiefs to redirect their energies westward, and seven days into Halsey's tenure in command of the theatre, the Japanese turned loose what would be their most ferocious and concentrated attack yet on America's island foothold. On Guadalcanal, something is in the air, Herbert Merrillat wrote. I am not sure what it is, but can make the obvious guess. All signs point to increased Jap activity, and soon. I expect it will be a pretty mighty blow, the climax of their efforts to retake this place. They have powerful naval forces to the northwest and have been building up a reserve of planes for more than two weeks. So look out for bombs and 14-inch naval shells and artillery. I'll bet they open up with field artillery from the hills. In short, it looks like a very hot time for the next few days. Operations officers and the command have suddenly become very secretive. There is an undercurrent of excitement in the CP. The new theatre commander did not long ponder how he would use the discretion Nimitz had allowed him. Just six days into his tenure as South Pacific commander, his desk covered with sighting reports of enemy ships in the waters northeast of the Solomons, 
Halsey ordered the Enterprise and Hornet to venture farther north than they had gone since August and seek battle. Doubling down on his aggressive willingness to take risks, he stood ready to send Rear Admiral Willis Lee's force, the battleship Washington and his cruisers, all the way up the slot to bombard Japanese harbours south of Bougainville. Lee, commanding the surface-striking force from the flagship Washington, with the cruisers San Francisco, Helena, Atlanta and ten destroyers, operated separately from the two carrier groups. Cruising south of Guadalcanal and east of Rennell Island, he prepared to sortie at sunset and enter Iron Bottom Sound from the west. His force would sweep the area off Cape Esperance and around Savo Island and, as the Atlanta's Lloyd Mustin put it in his diary, smash anything we find, maybe a close-range shotguns across the dinner table sort of affair. The convoys would get whatever ragtag escort Turner's staff could manage. The fleet's heavies had at last been unleashed to go hunting. They didn't catch any prey on their first run, but they made their presence felt hundreds of miles to the north. Word that an American battleship was in Savo Sound led the 8th Fleet's planners to cancel the Tokyo Express bombardment run scheduled for the night of October 25 to 26. The naval forces the Japanese were bringing down from Truk dwarfed anything the Americans had seen in the South Pacific to date. It was the full-scale seaborne counter-offensive that the 17th Army headquarters at Rabaul had been envisioning since the failures of September. An advance force under Vice Admiral Nobutak Kondo, including battleships and cruisers earmarked to support the Army's triumphant capture of Henderson Field and the aircraft carrier Junyo. Another carrier, the Hayo, should have been with Kondo too, but she had suffered an accidental fire on October 22 that forced her return to Truk. With them, steaming 200 miles to their east, came Chuichi Nagumo's striking force, comprising the carriers Shokaku, Zuikaku and Zuiho. South of Nagumo ploughed Rear Admiral Hiroaki Abe's vanguard force, including the battleships Hie and Kirishima and three heavy cruisers. Imperial plans were better coordinated than they had been two months ago, leading into the Battle of the Eastern Solomons, the campaign's first clash of carriers. They called for a bold combined assault, the heavy combatants descending on the island while the army mounted an assault on Henderson Field, and the carriers sweeping the seas of American naval power. The fleet would move south and engage as soon as the army sent word that it had seized the airfield. Yamamoto and his staff relished the thought of avenging Midway and luring the elusive American carriers to their destruction. The commander of the 17th Army, Lieutenant General Harukichi Hiyakutake, had planned to launch a multi-pronged assault on Henderson Field on the 22nd. Personally commanding the Japanese forces there, consisting of the 2nd Sendai Division, two battalions of the 38th Division, some survivors of Ichiki's and Kawaguchi's forces, as well as a regiment and three batteries of heavy field artillery, two battalions and one battery of field anti-aircraft artillery, one battalion and one battery of mountain artillery, a mortar battalion, a tank company, and three rapid-fire gun battalions. Hayakutaka began assembling his units and preparing to send them into position as soon as they piled ashore from the transports. The assault would begin with a diversionary artillery barrage from forces massing in the west, across the Matanikau River. The main assault, undertaken by the Sendai Division marshalled in the tangled jungle south of Henderson Field, would follow. Still underestimating US troop strength on the island, an intelligence report in late September pegged Vandergrift's garrison at 7,500 men, well below half its actual number. Hayakutake apparently remained as cocksure of his success as he had been on the day he ordered Colonel Ichiki's detachment to its slaughter. From their positions on the west side of the Matanikau River, Japanese heavy artillery began firing on Henderson Field, and the Diversionary Infantry Regiment tried to make its presence known to the Americans. With the preliminaries still underway, Hiakutake's staff radioed a confident message to 17th Army Headquarters at Rabul. The victory is already in our hands. Please rest your minds. He instructed his aides to begin planning for an American surrender. Words were words. The Japanese Navy wanted deeds. Frustrated by the Army's delays, and with Yamamoto threatening to haul the fleet back to Truk to refuel if ground commanders didn't get on with things, Kondo and Nagumo maintained course. As the Imperial Japanese Army was stalking the jungles surrounding Henderson Field, 
torrential rains engulfed the island, and then it was over, or so claimed a dispatch that reached the Yamato, moored at Truk that night. It was after 1.30am on the 24th when the telegram was given to Admiral Ugaki as he was meditating by moonlight on the weather deck. It was a dispatch from the 17th Army, proclaiming, 23 Banzai! A little before 23, the right wing captured the airfield. This settled everything, Ugaki wrote. He exhorted to his diary, march all forces to enlarge the result gained. Hesitation or indecision at this moment would leave a regret forever. And so the fleet pressed on. The announcement of the airfield's conquest led Vice Admiral Mikawa to send in the light cruiser Yura and several destroyer divisions to blockade the shore and bombard in support of the advancing Imperial Army. Later that morning, American planes from Henderson set upon the Yura, the 17th Army's claim to have captured the airfield notwithstanding. The ship took a bomb from an SBD, as did a destroyer. Later that afternoon, another flight of dive bombers, joined by half a dozen Bar 17s, let fly against the wounded ship, which had to be scuttled. Though the Americans had little sense of where the Japanese ground forces were located, the mustering of the Sendai Division had gone undetected by US ground patrols and search planes in the thick jungle south of Lunga Plain. American units were well positioned, with a perimeter divided into five regimental sectors. General Vandergrift would not be present for the coming assault on his perimeter. Urged by General Thomas Holcomb, the Commandant of the Marine Corps, who had picked an inopportune time to inspect Cactus, Vandergrift had travelled to Noumea to confer with Halsey. General Geiger, Vandergrift's aviation deputy, took temporary command of US forces on the island. On the night of October 23-24, to the Japanese offensive began with a diversionary attack from the west across the Matanikau River. American artillery smashed up the leading wedge of tanks. The next night, south of the high ground recently named Edson's Ridge, just half a mile from the airstrip, elements of the Sendai Division sent two powerful forces at Henderson Field. Each consisted of three rifle battalions, and with three more in reserve, the Japanese plan envisioned a powerful two-pronged surge toward the airfield. Owing to fatigue, confusion and poor communications, the attack was launched piecemeal. Conceived in general contempt for their enemy, the Japanese attack followed the same route as a disastrous September assault. On toward Edson's Ridge, the Japanese charged now, poorly coordinated and straight into a murderous enfilade of artillery and rifle fire. Colonel Chesty Puller's 700-man battalion from the well-seasoned 7th Marines joined with a battalion of the newly arrived 164th Infantry under Lieutenant Colonel Robert Hall, put up a stout defence despite their lack of advance warning on enemy preparations. When the pup-pup-pup of small arms fire finally faltered and died in the pre-dawn hours of October 25, the first assault had failed. The 17th Army's announcement that it captured the airfield might have been a deep misapprehension. It might even have been a lie. But on came the Japanese fleet. Encouraged by false reports of the Army's progress, Kondo and Nagumo kept their prows aimed south, searching for Halsey's fleet while standing by to hit Henderson Field too. Their carrier planes were reporting nothing but empty expanses of ocean. The land-based planes of the 11th Air Fleet, flying from Buin and Rabaul, made several sightings of Admiral Lee's Washington Task Force near Rennell Island. But the American heavy was too far away for Japanese aircraft to reach her. A superior Japanese force was advancing on bad intelligence. What result would flow from it was an imponderable that only another deadly trial by fire would solve. Chester Nimitz had developed a general approach for confronting a superior enemy. Having inferior forces, he wrote early in the campaign, we must count heavily on attrition, but losing no chance to come to grips with the enemy under the principle of calculated risk. Still, the principle's requirements were far from clear. How does one calculate and what does one risk? A doctrine so subjective offered little decision guidance at all. Its spirit was not prescriptive, it was merely advisory. But this seemed to be the American way of war. Commanders since the revolution had enjoyed the freedom to act on their best personal initiative. This flexibility and discretion was the gift and the burden that Nimitz always bestowed upon his commanders. Admiral Halsey was free to act on his instinct now, while Japanese scout pilots were revealing to their astonished command 
that Henderson Field, contrary to dispatches, had not been seized, Willis Lee's surface striking force, including the Washington and the heavy cruiser San Francisco, marked time about 30 miles east of Rennell Island, ready to run north for a sweep of Savo Sound. On the 24th, Rear Admiral Norman Scott was transferred from the San Francisco to the anti-aircraft cruiser Atlanta. His new flagship would soon be detached from Lee's Task Force 64 and, leading a striking force of destroyers, be thrown directly into the fight for Guadalcanal. Meanwhile, Halsey's two carrier groups, Task Force 16, with the Enterprise and South Dakota and Task Force 17, with the Hornet and a quartet of cruisers, under the overall command of Rear Admiral Thomas C. Kincaid, moved toward the suspected location of the Japanese carrier fleet, as if by the attraction of gravity. Late in the night of October 24, in his cabin in the Argonne in Noumea Harbour, Halsey prepared to adjourn his conference with General Vandergrift, Kelly Turner and senior Army and Marine officers. The ground commanders articulated the woes of the long-suffering garrison on Guadalcanal. They said morale was deteriorating under constant attacks and a sure, intuitive sense that more enemy forces were massing at Rabaul and Truk. According to Halsey, they began to echo the question that the public had asked in the weeks following Pearl Harbor, where is the Navy? It was late by the time the litany of the riflemen ended. Halsey asked Vandergrift and Major General Millard F. Harmon, the senior U.S. Army officer in the South Pacific, are we going to evacuate or hold? Vandergrift responded, I can hold, but I've got to have more active support than I've been getting. To this, Kelly Turner reacted defensively, pointing to difficulties of defending shoal-cluttered waterways with a fleet that was attriting as surely as the garrison was. Knowing no choice remained but to hold fast, Halsey took van der Grift's statement differently. According to the historian Richard B. Frank, if van der Grift had fired an arrow into Halsey's chest, he probably could not have wounded him more. It was simply unacceptable to Halsey for the Navy to be viewed by the Marines as not carrying its end. He told van der Grift, All right, go on back. I'll promise you everything I've got. For starters, Halsey reconsidered a plan, long on the boards, to use army troops to occupy Indeni in the Santa Cruz Islands. Gormley had authorised the operation even though General Harmon, the army's South Pacific Area Command Chief, considered it a wasteful diversion. So Halsey cancelled it, redirecting the soldiers earmarked for it to Guadalcanal. Halsey's more immediate task was deciding what to do about the threat from the combined fleet. Surveying intelligence and reconnaissance reports suggesting the approach of a Japanese carrier force he concluded that action was obviously a matter of hours. He took stock of the needs of the Marines and the capabilities of his naval force. He liked his chances a great deal better now that two carriers were on hand. Carrier power varies as the square, he wrote in his memoirs. Two carriers are four times as powerful as one. In a two-carrier task force, one carrier could be designated as the duty carrier, sending out air searches and providing combat air patrols and anti-submarine patrols, while the other carrier held a fully armed and fueled strike ready on deck. One carrier operating alone could do none of those things very effectively, and her crews were especially hard-pressed to switch between roles. Until the Enterprise arrived, our plight had been almost hopeless. Now we had a fighting chance, Halsey added. Determined to intercept Nagumo, Halsey ordered Kincaid to ring up 22 knots and take the Enterprise and Hornet task forces northwest from their patrol position east of Santa Cruz. A reprise of Midway, a curtain call for Coral Sea, the next collision of American and Japanese carrier air power would go down as the last aerial engagement between the fleets until US troops were on the beaches of Saipan and in the hedgerows of Normandy. Ashore, the Japanese hammer had struck the American anvil, it was the hammer that would crack. The fleets, meanwhile, prepared for their own reckoning. Just before midnight on October 24, as his marines ashore were battling the Japanese assault, Halsey radioed his principal naval commanders, Kincaid and Lee, with a galvanising message that would echo through the passageways and compartments of every ship in the South Pacific force. The four syllables, bereft of any operational specificity or doctrinal nuance and apropos of no particular target, placed a clean vector through everyone's mind that ordered and oriented their next moves. Strike repeat. Strike. 
23 Santa Cruz, even with knowledge that an enemy fleet was near, locating and attacking it effectively, was no small challenge for a carrier commander. Aircraft fuel was dear, range limited, weather variable, and intentions of opposing commanders ever unknowable. The doctrines that governed the mechanics of carrier operations, how many planes to send out searching, how many to retain in reserve for a strike, and how many to keep aloft nearby as a defensive umbrella for the fleet, were in a state of constant experiment and evolution. Then there was nature to contend with, given that strikes had to be launched into the wind to get heavy airplanes aloft, which compass heading did one need to pursue, and was the day too far gone to retrieve the aircraft during daylight? The Americans had a considerable advantage in Admiral Fitch's land-based PBY Catalina patrol bombers and B-17 flying fortresses operating out of Espiritu Santo and other area island groups. They had the ability to fly at night, and their range, at up to 800 miles, was peerless. On the morning of October 25, a flurry of sighting reports reached American commanders. At 9.30, a B-17 spied the Junio northeast of Malaita. Mere minutes later, a PBY spotted the battleships and cruisers of Abe's vanguard. This was followed by a third sighting ten minutes later, reporting three Japanese carriers. At the time of these sightings, the Japanese were about 300 miles northwest of the Santa Cruz Islands. Kincaid's and Murray's task forces were about an equal distance east of the islands. Realising he had been discovered, Admiral Nagumo, furious that his scouts hadn't yet found the US carriers, decided to reverse course to the north, taking his three valuable carriers out of range of potential attack. It was a wise and fortuitous move. A flight of B-17s was summoned from Espiritu at first contact, and the Enterprise too launched a strike. Nagumo knew all too well that the first carrier to be seen was usually the first to be sunk as well. The fact that the American strikes missed him was testimony to the value of caution. The pilots from the Enterprise, meanwhile, encountered the terror that beset even the most experienced pilots returning to their ship after dark. Attempting to land on the small flight deck at night, eight aircraft were lost, either forced to ditch or suffer damage on hard landings. Two pilots were killed. Through the night, Fitch's snoopers kept up a determined effort to relocate the Japanese carriers on the night patrol. On Guadalcanal that night, the Japanese army renewed its assault on Henderson Field, using the same general approach for a similarly grim result. General Hiyakutake's infantry, blistered by machine gun, mortar and canister fire, was forced to retreat. Japanese deaths were as many as 3,500. American fatalities in what would be known as the Battle for Henderson Field numbered around 90. As Vandergrift's men held again, the first report from the PBYs reached Kincaid around midnight and passed to Halsey. Dispatched shortly after 3 a.m. on the 26th, the report did not reach Kincaid for two hours. When it finally did, the vintage of the news persuaded him to hesitate. He would not launch his attack until fresher information came. The Enterprise, as the duty carrier, sent up the dawn patrol to resume searches to the west and north of the task force. At 6.17am, two dauntlesses working the western search sector spotted battleships, Abe's vanguard force, about 85 miles out. But it was the carriers that were prized most highly. Less than 30 minutes later, two other Enterprise aviators hit pay dirt, spying Nagumo's carriers to the west-northwest of Kincaid, about 200 miles away. Unfortunately for Kincaid, his decision to await better information before striking took place just as one of Kondo's scout planes finally located him. As a consequence of the American commander's delay and his bad luck in being spotted, the Japanese launched their principal attack about 20 minutes ahead of the Americans. At 7.32, the Hornet, operating about 10 miles from the Enterprise task force, began launching her first deck load of aircraft. Because Kondo was heading southeast, directly into the wind, whereas Kincaid's carriers were steaming with the wind and thus had to reverse course into the wind in order to launch or recover aircraft, the Japanese were quicker on the draw by about 30 minutes. By 7.40, 64 Japanese planes, a nearly even mix of Kate torpedo bombers, Val dive bombers and Zero fighters from the Shokaku, Zuikaku and Zuiho, were airborne and outbound. The American scout pilots who spotted Nagumo's carriers were quickly intercepted and driven into the clouds by the enemy combat air patrol. 
Two other Enterprise Dauntlesses heard the sighting report, navigated to locate the enemy fleet, and winged over into steep dives. Targeting the light carrier Zuiho, Lieutenant Stockton B. Strong and Ensign Charles B. Irvine planted a 500-pound bomb into the after part of her flight deck. The 50-foot hole would knock her out of the fray, but her strike pilots were already aloft, winging toward Kincaid's carriers. The two American carriers embarked 137 operational planes between them. Their four Japanese counterparts carried 194, 76 fighters, 60 dive bombers, 57 torpedo bombers, and a reconnaissance plane. But more important than numbers was the speed with which planes could locate and strike their targets. With this small but telling first blow, which destroyed the Zuiho's arresting gear and robbed her ability to recover aircraft, the Battle of Santa Cruz was joined. For commanders making split decisions amid great uncertainty, it was far from clear which approach prudence urged. Sending out planes to strike as quickly as they left the carrier deck, or having them gather in strength near their carriers before turning out after the enemy. With the two US task forces operating independently, separated by about 10 miles, it was not easy to combine the aircraft formations in any event. The pilots on the Enterprise received conflicting instructions on that score. What ensued was far from an orderly affair. With the Japanese 200 miles distant, fuel was too precious to burn circling to rendezvous. The principal strikes from the Hornet and Enterprise were hastily launched and ordered to seek the Japanese as soon as they were airborne. An Enterprise flight deck crewman held aloft a sign, Proceed with our Hornet, indicating that each carrier's strike group was on its own. By 8.20, a gaggle of 27 Dauntlesses, 20 Avengers and 23 Wildcats, loosely organised in three groups, was winging after Kondo. The leading American planes were airborne for barely 30 minutes when the Japanese strike came within view on a reciprocal flight path. Thus began an impromptu melee as nine Zeros peeled off from escort duty and dove down on the American flight about 60 miles northwest of the US carriers. The commander of Torpedo Squadron 10, Lieutenant Commander John A. Collett, flying in the leading four-plane section of Avengers, felt his aircraft shudder and his starboard wing dip. As the turret gunner opened up with his 50 caliber machine gun, Collette's radio man, Thomas C. Nelson Jr., got no response from his pilot over the intercom. Collette, forced to abandon his burning cockpit, threw back his canopy and crawled out onto the starboard wing. As Collette was whisked away into the airstream, never to be seen again, Nelson abandoned the radio man's compartment in the belly of the plane. He was the only survivor. The aerial scrimmage cost the Enterprise Air Group four Wildcats and four Avengers shot down or forced to turn back. The babel of voices on the pilot's radio frequency told Admiral Kincaid in the Enterprise of the Fracas that developed as the outbound American and Japanese airstrikes ran into each other. Connecting the dots, he sketched a picture of an inbound attack and ordered his carriers, still steaming about ten miles apart, to hustle the rest of their planes into the air. Shortly before nine o'clock, the inbound Japanese strike was bathed in the transmissions of the air search radar of the heavy cruiser Northampton, assigned to escort the Hornet in Task Force 17. Somehow, neither the Hornet's nor the Enterprise's electronic eyes ever saw the bogies. The Northampton skipper, not knowing this, relayed word to the Hornet in a leisurely way, by signal flags rather than by a faster but less secure radio broadcast. As a result, the Enterprise never received word at all. Worse, the Enterprise's inexperienced fighter director officer, responsible for guiding the combat air patrol to its targets, whiffed completely. He reported the angle of approach of the Japanese strike with reference to the relative heading of his ship. Such a pole star was of little use to any pilot who couldn't see the reporting vessel. And so on that cloudy day, most of the 37 Wildcat jockeys flying combat air patrol failed to intercept the attack before it was already over their carrier. Fortunately for the Enterprise, she found concealment in a rain squall. As a result, the first Japanese airstrike fell on the perpetrator of the Doolittle raid, the Hornet. As the Hornet's outbound strike group left its task force behind, some of the pilots saw the black puffs of flak dotting the skies behind them. That's when they knew the Japanese had found their ship, a flight of 21 Val dive bombers from the Zuikaku, under command of Lieutenant Sadamu Takahashi, 
were the first to attack the Hornet. Two other Enterprise Dauntlesses heard the sighting report, navigated to locate the enemy fleet, and winged over into steep dives. Targeting the light carrier Zuiho, Lieutenant Stockton B. Strong and Ensign Charles B. Irvine planted a 500-pound bomb into the afterpart of her flight deck. The 50-foot hole would knock her out of the fray, but her strike pilots were already aloft, winging toward Kincaid's carriers. The two American carriers embarked 137 operational planes between them. Their four Japanese counterparts carried 194, 76 fighters, 60 dive bombers, 57 torpedo bombers, and a reconnaissance plane. But more important than numbers was the speed with which planes could locate and strike their targets. With this small but telling first blow, which destroyed the Zuiho's arresting gear and robbed her ability to recover aircraft, the Battle of Santa Cruz was joined. For commanders making split decisions amid great uncertainty, it was far from clear which approach prudence urged. Sending out planes to strike as quickly as they left the carrier deck, or having them gather in strength near their carriers before turning out after the enemy. With the two US task forces operating independently, separated by about 10 miles, it was not easy to combine the aircraft formations in any event. The pilots on the Enterprise received conflicting instructions on that score. What ensued was far from an orderly affair. With the Japanese 200 miles distant, fuel was too precious to burn circling to rendezvous. The principal strikes from the Hornet and Enterprise were hastily launched and ordered to seek the Japanese as soon as they were airborne. An Enterprise flight deck crewman held aloft a sign, Proceed with our Hornet, indicating that each carrier's strike group was on its own. By 8.20, a gaggle of 27 Dauntlesses, 20 Avengers and 23 Wildcats, loosely organised in three groups, was winging after Kondo. The leading American planes were airborne for barely 30 minutes when the Japanese strike came within view on a reciprocal flight path. Thus began an impromptu melee as nine Zeros peeled off from escort duty and dove down on the American flight about 60 miles northwest of the US carriers. The commander of Torpedo Squadron 10, Lieutenant Commander John A. Collett, flying in the leading four-plane section of Avengers, felt his aircraft shudder and his starboard wing dip. As the turret gunner opened up with his 50 caliber machine gun, Collette's radio man, Thomas C. Nelson Jr., got no response from his pilot over the intercom. Collette, forced to abandon his burning cockpit, threw back his canopy and crawled out onto the starboard wing. As Collette was whisked away into the airstream, never to be seen again, Nelson abandoned the radio man's compartment in the belly of the plane. He was the only survivor. The aerial scrimmage cost the Enterprise Air Group four Wildcats and four Avengers shot down or forced to turn back. The babel of voices on the pilot's radio frequency told Admiral Kincaid in the Enterprise of the Fracas that developed as the outbound American and Japanese airstrikes ran into each other. Connecting the dots, he sketched a picture of an inbound attack and ordered his carriers, still steaming about ten miles apart, to hustle the rest of their planes into the air. Shortly before nine o'clock, the inbound Japanese strike was bathed in the transmissions of the air search radar of the heavy cruiser Northampton, assigned to escort the Hornet in Task Force 17. Somehow, neither the Hornet's nor the Enterprise's electronic eyes ever saw the bogies. The Northampton skipper, not knowing this, relayed word to the Hornet in a leisurely way, by signal flags rather than by a faster but less secure radio broadcast. As a result, the Enterprise never received word at all. Worse, the Enterprise's inexperienced fighter director officer, responsible for guiding the combat air patrol to its targets, whiffed completely. He reported the angle of approach of the Japanese strike with reference to the relative heading of his ship. Such a pole star was of little use to any pilot who couldn't see the reporting vessel. And so on that cloudy day, most of the 37 Wildcat jockeys flying combat air patrol failed to intercept the attack before it was already over their carrier. Fortunately for the Enterprise, she found concealment in a rain squall. As a result, the first Japanese airstrike fell on the perpetrator of the Doolittle raid, the Hornet. As the Hornet's outbound strike group left its task force behind, some of the pilots saw the black puffs of flak dotting the skies behind them. That's when they knew the Japanese had found their ship. A flight of 21 Val dive bombers from the Zuikaku, 
under command of Lieutenant Sadamu Takahashi, were the first to attack the Hornet. To the dismay of the carrier's crew, half of her powerful 5-inch anti-aircraft battery was effectively disabled when the young officer who supervised the after 5-inch battery drove the guns into the stops, freezing them in a horizontal elevation just as the first enemy dive bomber appeared overhead. Believe you me, the gun captains took this very, very personal, all his training, everything, right out the window, gunner's mate first class Alvin Gran remembered. Five of our most lethal guns now sat with their barrels locked in place. They would have made mincemeat out of that plane. As the wildcats on combat air patrol tangled with the escorting Zeros, the Japanese dive bombers concentrated on their target, hitting the Hornet with three bombs. A val struck by anti-aircraft fire fell burning and crashed into the island superstructure in a wash of flames. The plane penetrated several decks, spreading fire as it went, straight down into a squadron-ready room one deck below the flight deck. Its 500-pound bomb was found later, unexploded and rolling around in a passageway outside. As the valves were doing their work, torpedo bombers from the Shokaku were down low on the water, closing on the Hornet from two directions, off the starboard bow and the port quarter. The textbook anvil attack would expose the carrier to torpedoes from one group of Kates or the other, no matter which way she turned. In short minutes, two torpedoes were crashing into the carrier's starboard side, flooding both fire rooms and snuffing out her propulsion and power. The time was 9.15, m several hundred miles to the north. Admiral Nagumo was in no place to celebrate. Overhead, pilots from the Hornet's two dauntless-equipped squadrons had found his carriers. As the commander of Scouting Squadron 8, Lieutenant Commander William Gus Widhelm, surveyed the fleet below, four Zeros from the Shokaku piled in to intercept. Keiji and determined the American dive bombers, no match for Japanese fighters in air-to-air -air combat, avoided the slashing head-on passes and high-side runs of the Japanese combat air patrol. When the leader of the Japanese fighter section dove on Widhelm from 12 o'clock high, the American pulled back his stick and turned loose with his fifties. If a dive bomber seldom beat a fighter in an aerial duel, a veteran could occasionally pick his spot. The converging planes were just a short football field apart when the Zero's engine caught fire and exploded. Widhelm flew through the debris and continued closing with the Shokaku ahead. As Zeros and Dauntlesses engaged in their murderous dance, a Japanese pilot lined up Widhelm's plane and pulled a burst from his 20mm cannons. As Widhelm's squadron mates were hurtling down upon the Shokaku in 70-degree dives, heads hunched forward peering into their bomb sights, dive brakes gripping the air, it was a sure mark of their spirit that as Widhelm's engine coughed smoke and died, his comrades found their hearts on fire listening to his navy grade cussing about the lack of effective help from the Hornet's fighters as he guided his smoking aircraft into the sea. Surviving the crash landing, Widhelm would be left to observe the exploits of his comrades from a bobbing yellow life raft. It wasn't long before Lieutenant James E. Mo Vose, the leader of the Hornet's second flight of Dauntlesses from Bombing Squadron 8, found Nagumo's carriers. Radioing a sighting report, they pushed over on the Shokaku and piled in. Dauntlesses, flying search or scouting missions, carried a half-sized 500-pound bomb, the better to extend their range. Dauntlesses, armed for strikes, carried a 1,000-pound egg. Vose's aviators were loaded for bear. As they dove down on the speeding, swerving Shokaku, the veteran of the Pearl Harbor attack gamely skidded out of the path of the first three or four big bombs. The next few... All of them thousand-pounders scored heavily, shattering the carrier's flight deck and destroying her centre elevator. By 9.30, with fires sweeping through her hangar deck, the Shokaku was no longer capable of flight operations. She could still make 31 knots, but she, like the Zuiho before her, was out of the fight. The heavy cruiser Chikuma, less valuable than the Shokaku but an important naval asset nonetheless, took a couple of bombs from Hornet Bombing Squadron 8 aviators and two near misses from Enterprise Dauntless jockeys and was left battered and burning but navigable, with almost 200 dead. Thirty minutes after the US attack pilots first set upon their targets, they were finished with their attacks and bound for home. During the lull that followed the first attacks on the Hornet, the Northampton manoeuvred to take the crippled carrier under tow.
Several miles away, in Task Force 16, Admiral Kincaid learned of the Hornet's ill fortune when the word reached him that his flagship, the Enterprise, was to land all returning planes, including those from the Hornet. The Big E was preparing another airstrike at the time, her ordnance men loading bombs onto racks, pulsing fuel hoses everywhere. If an enemy attack arrived in that vulnerable window, it could be disastrous. As it happened, it was an American plane that drew first blood from the Enterprise Task Force. It was the fluky kind of thing that only seems to happen in wartime. Just before 10am, the pilot of a damaged Avenger was waved off from his first approach on the Enterprise. Unable to circle for another landing attempt, he ditched near the destroyer porter. As he and his crew scrambled into the life raft, the destroyer approached them and stopped. The deck force was preparing to take the flight crew aboard when a lookout yelled, Torpedo wake on the port bow! Pilots overhead spotted the missile, tracing a counterclockwise circle ahead of the porter. They dove down and made two strafing passes in an effort to detonate the weapon short of the ship, but onward it churned, finally striking portside amidships. The blast killed 15 sailors and left the ship fit only for scuttling, though another destroyer would report a suspicious periscope as she was manoeuvring to recover survivors. In fact, the torpedo had come from the very plane that the porter was racing to save. It jarred loose on impact with the water. Just minutes later, the Japanese strike reached the Enterprise group. From high above the 6,000-foot cloud ceiling from astern the Enterprise fell a waterfall of vowels, unopposed by US fighters. The newly outfitted South Dakota, the heaviest ship in the Enterprise's screen, joined by the anti-aircraft cruiser San Juan and the heavy cruiser Portland, put up a staggering volume of fire. As each plane came down, an American pilot reported, a veritable cone of tracer shells enveloped it. You could see it being hit and bounced by exploding shells. Radar-directed five-inch gunfire was lethal. The South Dakota and the San Juan led the screen in downing a total of 32 enemy planes bearing down on Task Force 16. An officer on the Junio was stunned by the paltry number of aircraft that returned. The planes lurched and staggered onto the deck, every single fighter and bomber bullet holed. As the pilots climbed wearily from their cramped cockpits, they told of unbelievable opposition, of skies choked with anti-aircraft shell bursts and tracers. A bomber squadron leader would return to the Junio, so shaken that at times he could not speak coherently, but no defence could be perfect. Between 1017 and 1020, the Enterprise took three bombs through her flight deck. It was only by deft ship handling that her new captain, Osborne B. Hardison, who had replaced Captain Arthur C. Davis just three days before the battle, evaded the deadlier missiles released by the torpedo planes. Good work by firefighting and damage control crews prevented the bomb explosions from burning the carrier beyond salvation. At 10.20, a pilot returning from attacking the Japanese fleet crash-landed his damaged Avenger near the South Dakota, mistaking the aircraft's stout cylindrical fuselage for a surfacing submarine. Gunners on the battleship and nearby destroyers took the plane under fire. The destroyer Preston, manoeuvring to rescue the pilot and his crew, had to veer away to escape being raked by fire from the battleship's secondary guns. No feat of ship handling that day surpassed the one turned in by the captain of the destroyer Smith. During the air attack, a stricken Japanese torpedo plane, hotly pursued by a wildcat, fell smoking toward the ship and crashed into her forecastle. As the flames engulfed the entire forward part of the destroyer, her skipper, Lieutenant Commander Hunter Wood, steered his burning vessel into the voluminous spray thrown up by the wake of the fast-stepping South Dakota ahead of him. The cascades of froth washed over the decks, bringing the fires under control. The stricken Hornet's chances were not helped by a signal that her captain had issued around noon via blinker light, go to Enterprise. Her commander had intended the signal for the many American pilots overhead who were looking for a place to land. When the Northampton's signal department repeated the signal, the Juno's commander, Captain Lyman K. Swenson, believed the message was meant for him. At once, the anti-aircraft cruiser turned out of formation and rang up full speed to join Task Force 16 over the horizon. Task Force 17 badly needed the Juno's heavy anti-aircraft battery. In the 13-minute long air attack that morning, her gunners claimed credit for a dozen of the many Japanese planes that were seen to fall around the task force. 
The American command's insistence on operating its carriers separately doomed the Hornet to a lonely death. At 1.35pm, having recovered his returning strike aircraft, Kincaid elected to withdraw south with Task Force 16. The Enterprise, with the South Dakota and her other escorts, turned southeast. This was bad news for the Hornet, for nearly an hour ago Japanese pilots had spotted her and reported a target of opportunity. The Enterprise departed the scene, taking her protective umbrella of fighter aircraft with her. Another Japanese strike, this one launched by the Junio, arrived later. With the appearance of more enemy planes, the Northampton cast off her towing wire to the Hornet in favour of renewed evasive manoeuvring. With a 15-degree list and a rudder jammed to starboard, the Hornet was a poor candidate for salvage in any event. Adrift, she faced yet another attack. With our air cover gone, the Japs had it pretty much their own way, gunner's mate Alvin Gran recalled. Dive bombers and torpedo planes, like I say, all mixed up. There were destroyers and cruisers zigzagging all over the place and firing their guns like mad, and the Jap torpedo bombers had trouble trying to line up on the Hornet with so many other vessels in the way. The torpedo planes finally were able to find an opening along our starboard side, and that's when we really caught hell. One of them dropped a torpedo and then swooped up and over the flight deck. Somebody hit him good and he caught fire. Just a mass of flames, with the landing gear falling off and all. The pilot laid his plane right over and made a tight circle and came back and smashed into the port side. The plane's engine and fuselage penetrated four or five staterooms and kept right on going and ended up in the forward elevator pit. All this punishment left us without power or water pressure, dead in the water and fighting fires with bucket brigades. The Enterprise Task Force came under a final attack too. For all the withering resistance their brothers had met over the American carrier task forces, the pilots who flew on Kondo's final strike of the day, launched by the late arriving Junio, braved the gauntlet once again. They put a 500-pound bomb into the San Juan that penetrated her thin decks and exploded beneath her, wrecking her rudder. Another bomb hit the forward turret of the South Dakota. Exploding atop the heavily armoured roof, this blast had nowhere to go but up and out. Every officer on the battleship's bridge except one hit the deck. That officer was Thomas Gatch. The ship's captain was standing on a catwalk forward of the conning tower, watching the Enterprise ahead of him through the evening mist. The popular commander, who prized a certain kind of honour from studying Napoleon's wars, the literature of Shakespeare, and the history of the war between the states, would say later that it was beneath the dignity of a captain of a US man of war to duck for a Japanese bomb. The reward for his bravado was a spray of shrapnel that nicked his jugular vein. As the chief quartermaster hastened to pressure the wound, the ship's doctor made his way to the bridge. Rumours flew that Gatch was near death. For him, readiness to do battle put everything else below decks. Spit and polish, out. Regimentation for its own sake, out. Discipline as a means of encouraging anything other than fighting efficiency, out. His medical condition was the chief topic among the crew for days. As the Hornet foundered and listed, her fires out of control. Carrying one eleven dead, two American destroyers were detailed to ease her into death. The Mustin and the Anderson trained out their torpedo batteries on the carrier and fired, but each failed to put her under. The destroyers then turned to their guns, popping five-inch rounds into the Hornet's waterline. After several hundred rounds, her fires were all the hungrier, but still she refused to go. It was after the Americans had left her to the night, around 1.30 a.m., with fires raging so badly that she would be of little use even if the Japanese seized her as a war prize, that Kondo's men of war closed with the Hulk. It was Japanese destroyers that finally put the Hornet under with their torpedoes. The foregoing, evidently, was enough drama for one day. Disliking his chances with one damaged flattop against two unscarred enemy carriers, the Zuikaku and Junyo were at large and dangerous, and he knew nothing of the shredded state of their air groups. Kincaid continued retiring. He would face stern second-guessing for his decision to abandon the Hornet. Rear Admiral Hiroaki Abe, the commander of the Vanguard Force, would be censured for caution too. He elected not to pursue Kincaid's withdrawing Enterprise Task Force as night fell on October 26. The decision couldn't have been for lack of motivation.
He had been present at the Battle of Cape Esperance, where his lifelong friend Aritomo Goto had fallen. He had heard tell of Goto's dying profanities. Bakayaro! As the cruiser Ioba was smashed by forces he had believed were friendly. As their ship slugged south in the company of the battered Enterprise, the crew of the South Dakota turned to the ceremonies by which they honoured their dead. After dark, Captain Thomas Gatch ordered the engines slowed and came to a stop so that a proper burial at sea could be conducted for her first two dead. The night was black, and a feeling of gloom pressed down like a weight. The chaplain, Commander James V. Claypool, kept a strong grip on the belt of the nearest pallbearer, lest he stumble and fall overboard as he intoned the words, For as much as the spirit of the departed has returned to God who gave it, we therefore commit his body to the depths of the sea. Captain Gatch was below decks, and for all the celebrants knew he might well be next off the slab. Untold hundreds of men lay dead on other ships or were already within the sea's embrace. As the South Dakota's attending crew performed the committal, raising one end of the burial slab so that the bodies could slide into the sea, Claypool read the benediction. May the Lord bless thee and keep thee. As he spoke, the moon shone through a break in the clouds, illuminating the decks of the great ship. Claypool thought it was a signal of immortality awaiting all who believed. The South Dakota had taken aboard the survivors of the porter. The destroyer lost that day to the crashing Avenger's wayward torpedo. The survivors were given clothes, smokes, bedding, and anything else they needed. Several of that ship's engine room crew, badly burned in the fire from the torpedo, died in the battleship's sickbay. The captain of the porter asked Claypool to do the rites as the destroyer's crew gathered aft. In their borrowed clothes they stood in a horseshoe on the fantail of our ship, listening to the words of hope and love spoken by our Lord Jesus Christ. They wiped away tears with the sleeves of their dungarees, but they left the burial service with shoulders straightened and heads high. Watching them, I thought I heard a bugle sounding the thrilling navy call. Carry on, Claypool wrote. When the ship returned to Noumea after the October 26 battle, the wounded men sent away to hospital ships begged to be allowed to return, but only if Gatch remained in command. Was he alive? They wanted to know. All too well, the South Pacific Area Command Medical Corps would tell them. He was said to be a difficult patient. Chaplain Claypool kept him on the straight and narrow. Gatch followed a British tradition that required the captain to read the scripture lesson at Mass, the captain's faith no doubt empowered his chaplain, who thought that organised religion was a natural thing for a navy to promote. Men have to have something in their heads, he would write. If they don't have religion, superstition rushes to fill the vacuum. They don't stand up under fire. In the navy, we take along religion as we take along ammunition. The South Dakota had loaded that particular magazine to capacity while en route to the theatre. Crossing the international date line, Claypool was pleased to find himself with back-to-back -back Sundays, thanks to the change in time zones. The Japanese wasted no time making the most optimistic claims about the performance of their flyers that day. I wish we had as many carriers as they claim to have sunk, Nimitz wrote to Catherine the following day. But no tall tales were needed to claim a material victory. Numerically or tactically, it was a Japanese victory, Tamichi Hara, an IJN destroyer captain, would write, echoing American opinion at least with respect to ship losses. The Americans had entered the fray with a tactical and psychological advantage, but complacence had cost them a high price. The enemy was able to strike at times and places of his choosing. To his surprise, the head and tail of the Japanese opponent were versatile and flexible, contrary to Midway, and they struck back effectively with what force they had. Though the losses of aircraft were about equal, 97 Japanese planes were lost against 81 US. It was in personnel casualties that America gained its most striking, if seldom appreciated, victory. In Japan's first concentrated exposure to state-of-the-art anti-aircraft fire, 148 pilots and aircrew died, a third more than at midway. Fully half of Nagumo's dive-bomber flight crews were lost. American squadrons suffered 20 dead on the day, plus four more rescued by the enemy and taken prisoner. The leadership in the IJN squadron ready rooms took a severe blow. 23 squadron and section leaders were lost. By sundown that day, 
More than half of the pilots who had hit Pearl Harbor on December 7th had been killed in action. The carriers, Zuikaku and Junyo, though not seriously damaged, were forced home to Japan for want of men to fly their planes. With the evisceration of its naval air crews, the Japanese suffered a critical deficit that they would never make up. Captain Hara's assessment was a profound understatement. Considering the great superiority of our enemy's industrial capacity, we must win every battle overwhelmingly. This last one, unfortunately, was not an overwhelming victory. The battle took a heavy toll from the Japanese carrier force, and also from its long-time commander, Chuichi Nagumo. Haggard and old, appearing to friends to have aged twenty years in less than a year of action, Nagumo was relieved in command of the carrier-striking force by Jisaburo Ozawa, a destroyer man whose abilities as a task force commander were unknown to his peers. After the Battle of Santa Cruz, the United States would have not a single operable carrier task force in the South Pacific until the Enterprise could be repaired at Noumea and placed back into service. Task Force 17 was dissolved with the sinking of the Hornet, and with the Enterprise going to the yard for repairs, the South Dakota was sent to join the Washington in Task Force 64. Having exhausted their carrier forces in the seas east of Guadalcanal on October 26, the opposing fleets returned to their bases to regroup. With Halsey's and Yamamoto's carriers sidelined for now, the question to be answered in the parry and thrust of the coming weeks was, which side's surface combat fleet would step up and control the seas by night? No matter how gallantly men might fight on land, they would not hold on long if their navy finally failed them. In a few short weeks, the greatest challenge yet to the American position on Guadalcanal would loom in the dark waters of Savo Sound.